Hi, everyone. Welcome to our virtual road trip. I'm Molly Berry with ATS, and I'm so happy that you could join us. Today, Tanya Nash is moderating a discussion with Eric Beal from the Ohio DOT, Corey Pelletier from Anderson, Columbia, and Brett Stanton from the Asphalt Pavement Association of Michigan. They're going to talk all things RAP, like what are the restrictions, and which states have an abundant supply, and which could be facing a shortage. And how does the BMD and EPD movement affect rap usage? And maybe even who Tanya's favorite rappers are. <laughs> so just kidding. As a reminder, you are all in listen only mode. So we'd love to have you join the conversation. And if you feel so inclined, raise your hand and we'll unmute you so you can address the panel audibly. You can also type a question or comment in the Q&A box at any time. So as I mentioned, today's co-pilots are Eric Beal, Corey Pelletier, Brett Stanton, and Tanya Nash. Eric Beal is the State Asphalt Materials Engineer for the Ohio DOT. He's a professional engineer and earned his bachelor's in civil engineering and surveying from Ohio University. Eric is extremely involved in the asphalt industry, serving as chair in several ASHTO task forces, TRB committees, and NCHRP project panels. He leads numerous Ohio DOT research projects, is a member of the Asphalt Emulsion Task Force Group, and vice chair for Capri. Corey Pelletier has 26 years of experience in the heavy highway construction industry, working on asphalt projects in Florida, Texas, Missouri, Kansas, Iowa, North Carolina, South Carolina, Alabama, and Georgia. He started his career with Anderson Columbia in Florida, and while he earned his bachelor's degree in construction engineering from the University of Florida. Corey then moved to Kansas City to work for APAC and later returned to Anderson Columbia in Florida. Earlier this year, he and his family moved to Texas where he accepted an executive role with the company. Brett Stanton joined the Asphalt Pavement Association of Michigan as the executive director in April of 2020. Before joining the association, he worked for two different Midwest paver producers, managing special projects and business development, as well as leading a technical services and civil engineering department. Brett earned his bachelor's and master's degrees in civil engineering from Michigan Technological University. Tanya Nash is the Director of Engineering at ATS. She earned her bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of Florida in biomedical engineering. Tanya serves on many state and national committees and research projects, continually expanding her knowledge in asphalt properties and characteristics nationwide. So I think that's all the housekeeping notes. Tanya, if you're ready, I think we're ready to depart. All right, thank you, Molly. Um, I have to say that, Corey, I am not sure I knew that you spanned that many states. That was <laughs> quite a quite a state list. Yeah. And to really kind of kick it off in that in that direction, um, guys, we're here to talk about rap, kind of the hurdles that we have with rap, the usage, the practices, and I'm going to encourage um, our listeners at any time that you have a question, please type it into the Q and A. Uh, link on the bottom, and I will get to them and work them into the conversation as it goes along. So don't wait, you don't feel like you have to wait till the end. Um, but I'm going to start off and kind of go around and Corey, I'm going to let you pick the state, preferably the one that you're currently in, um, and kind of give us a rundown of the specifications involving RAP that you're currently facing. And then the same with uh, Brett in Michigan and Eric mm -hmm. in Ohio. And let's see where we can go from there. Hello, everybody. Um, I'll start off with Texas, uh, just because that's currently where I'm located and get a little bit of uh, familiar with what uh, what we're experiencing here in Texas. And I think other contractors are as well. Um, you guys, everybody probably notices who follows, you know, the Napa survey. They probably uh, notice that Texas, um, you know, is down on the percentage of wrap used in, in mixes and and um, I can offer some insight on I, on the reasons why I think that may be the case. Um, one of the one of the reasons I think uh, most of it is, you know, um, obviously Texas is a primarily a dominant um, asphalt state, just like most states are. Um, but the larger metropolitan areas like Houston, Dallas, and so on, um, are primarily concrete state or concrete uh, towns. So 
um, most of your major interstate systems and in, uh, in uh, freeways and stuff like that are concrete. So asphalt is only used as a bond breaker. Um, but you get out into the more rural areas of Texas, which there is a, a lot of rural areas in Texas when you get out, you know, in South Texas and west, out west and stuff. Um, but there's still a lot of lane miles of asphalt. Um, you, uh, you know, you don't have a lot of stationary plants in those areas just because the market doesn't demand, you know, people don't, don't have stationary plants in those areas. So a lot of times, you know, contractors are forced to uh, move in a portable plant uh, into a location and do that specific project and then move out. So a lot of them are mill and fill projects. So they're having to take, you know, the, the asphalt that they're getting from that project and the, the wrap and introduce it back into the mix as they produce it for that project. Um, but one thing uh, here lies the problem is, is TxDOT um, requires uh, binder testing on anything above 20%. Um, so if you have more than 20% wrap in the mix, they require you to do binder testing. So that's why you see most people hovering around that 19 to 20% range because they don't want to go over that 20% threshold because then they're going to be required to do the binder testing. And then it becomes a timing issue, especially on a mill and fill project in the rural areas, because binder testing, as we know, you know, is not something that you, you know, it's not like running a gradation where you're going to have results in an hour. So, um, you know, versus like if you have a large stockpile at a permanent plant facility and you already know what you have in that pile. Um, because you've had the time to run all the testing, you know, required testing and stuff. So then you're obviously going to put the maximum amount of wrap in. Um, with that being said, uh, uh, to my knowledge, TxDOT does not have um, a limit on the amount of wrap that you can use. They just have requirements, anything above 20%. So, you know, that that's basically, um, you know, what's kind of hindering our uh, usage uh, of wrap in, in Texas. Um, and uh, just because, you know, a lot of the asphalt is is performed and placed in, in more of the rural areas or smaller cities. Um, and, um, and so, you know, primarily you're using the wrap that came off of that project. Um, so it's all about, it's all about speed and timing, you know, um, you know, that's, that's really what it boils down to. Um, and, um, you know, the other thing also is, is that TxDOT, uh, there are exceptions, of course, everything's underneath, under the uh, engineer's discretion, depending on which region you're in. Um, but primarily they like or prefer the wrap to come from a state owned project. So it kind of limits you to, um, you know, wrap that came off of a farm to market road or, or a, um, um, for an example, like a Walmart parking lot or something like that. So you really have to separate your piles, um, you know, and make sure that uh, you're keeping your state wrap separate from your other, other wrap. Um, and uh, a lot of it is because, um, you know, from obviously the oil industry in Texas is huge and the fracking and stuff. And um, a major reason is a lot of these farm to market roads are now used as haul roads for, for fracking for the, for the tanker trucks. Um, but when these roads were first designed and developed back years ago, they were, a lot of them were just chip and seal roads and they don't have a good aggregate base structure. Uh, a lot of them is, you know, you, you know, in Texas, caliche clay. Um, so of course these, trucks are just running on top of chip and seal with the caliche K, you know, clay base. And, uh, you, you know, you, you've got a lot of rutting. So, um, so that, that's kind of a, that's kind of a been an issue. Um, and, uh, so that's kind of one of the, one of the ways, you know, that's, that's keeping our percentages down in, in Texas, I believe. Okay. Thank you. And Brett, how about you, you guys in Michigan? What kind of specifications do you guys have uh, currently for your wrap? 
Yeah, so I'll uh, I'll keep it simple and just stick to the DOT side of things. So there's a number of variations outside of that, but for the DOT side of things, uh, it's fairly simple. It's a percent binder replacement criteria uh, based on three tiers. Um, zero to seventeen percent is what's called tier one. Um, for that tier, uh, nothing is required. Uh, the contractor may put in up to seventeen percent binder replacement and run the mix at the you know, plan grade, uh, plan binder grade that is, and, uh, and, and let it rip. Uh, tier two is 18 up to 27%. Um, for there, for the most part, uh, there are a few exceptions, but for the most part, uh, a binder dump is required, at least on the low end. Um, contractors option whether or not they drop the, the top grade as well. Um, and or you can do a blending chart in tier two to show that you have not impacted the final plan grade. And then tier three is anything above 27%. Um, so theoretically to 100%, um, obviously you still have to meet all the volumetric requirements of standard mixed design stuff. So um, there are uh, hurdles to overcome to, to get high wrap. Um, but in that case, you have to go through and do a full um, binder grading and, and do blending charts and everything like that to show what the um, virgin binder grade must be in order to meet the plan grade again on the low end um, top end is, is contractor options so that's it in a nutshell it's pretty simple spec okay that sounds good um and eric our our loan specifier in the room um talk to us about your specification with rap so we have two methods, um, basically the difference is 5% wrap. Um, method two was developed because our administration wanted us to use more wrap. So um, we required more pro a little bit more processing with method two. Um, we range anywhere from 15 to 25% on the surface mixes for max, 40% for intermediate, and heavy traffic, 45% wrap, and then your medium light traffic bases um, are 55 max. We don't technically hit those points, but um, you see pretty high wrap. Um, I think probably what restricts us is we have a minimum total virgin binder. So we don't necessarily do the RBR, we do a total minimum virgin binder. Um, Anything greater than 25% requires a minus 28 grade or a minus 22 grade state. Um, so basically intermediates, or intermediates and bases would, that's where that would apply. Okay. That's pretty much it in a nutshell, so. Perfect. So listening to the three of you talk about the specifications that you guys are from a day-to-day -day basis are up against. Um, I would say that one similarity comes to mind is when people talk about like scope creep or spec creep, and it's just, if you could go look at the mixed design or the matrix of how each state does mixed designs, right? There's all limitations from the original Ashto or the MS2 version of what SuperPave was supposed to be developed on. There's little nuances in every single state. I don't know if anybody's actually doing a, a true to the letter super paid design anymore. And it sounds like there is a lot of similarities in the rap side too. So I guess my next question to you guys is how much do you guys look at your neighboring states? I can imagine that, you know, like Eric, you're not going to go and look at somebody like Arizona for, you know, a similarity in specs. But you may look to uh, Michigan and say, okay, well, what are you guys doing? And at what point does it become uh, to, so different that your neighboring state is almost unrecognizable in comparison? So can you talk a little bit from a DOT standpoint, when you see that, is that ever go through your head when you're looking at them? Not for RAP. I guess that's not something I've ever really considered. I'm sure I've asked questions um, and we do, we look at neighboring states, basically the five states that connect us. Um, we're all relatively similar climates. I mean, obviously the UP and Michigan is a, a lot different in the winter, but um, yeah, I don't, for RAP, we really don't look at it. Um, we still use Marshall. I don't, 
think a lot of states do that anymore. Um, so that's part of part of some of our changes. But we really haven't followed the uh, super paid standards since the late 90s. We made changes pretty quick. Did you find that to be different though, going from super paid to Marshall or Marshall to super paid and backwards? Um, as far as the how the rep reacted? Or Eric's time, but um, <laughs> I don't, there's really not a big difference between, I mean, it's how you compact the specimens re realistically. Um, and what super pave is our heavy traffic, so we're using polymers more in those um, than what we would with a base or a, maybe a Marshall intermediate mix. Other than that, it's the mass. The, the mass is the same. So, okay. Uh, so, from Brett, from an industry or representative's viewpoint, when you talk to the other SAPAs and you're in conversation saying, "Yeah, the industry is want wants to use more. They want to use more rep." How do you, for example, when you're talking to a colleague, how do you approach your state when you say, "Okay, well, this is." What's coming to the table? How do we get this to this rep percentage to go up? So, what kind of things do you see? Um, do you see a lot of differences? I should say in that conversation with your other SAPAs. Yeah, I mean, I think we see that on multiple specifications. Every state knows best, and it's not it's not what whatever neighboring state uh, it is. I think for kind of like Eric's experience, at least here in Michigan. Um, as an industry, we haven't really been comparing our RAP spec to other states' RAP spec. I think I feel like we're sitting in a pretty good spot. We are, again, you know, open-ended on that tier three side of things. If somebody wants to try to work towards designing that, they can. Um, say really our kind of our biggest limitation um, you know, next to supply in certain areas is probably our Department of Environmental Quality um, to get a plant permitted here. Um, they often restrict the amount of wrap that can be used, grading your permit, whether it be 40% or 50% average over the year. Um, and so we've got a number of members in commercial markets that will bump right up against that um, day, you know, for the entire year, because um, obviously the private side, you know, we're we're running higher and doing other things to meet those specifications. But I'd say to, to answer your question, we don't really measure ourselves against other states, but yeah, there is huge discrepancies uh, just you know on our borders, let alone you know um, nationwide, like you mentioned, Arizona that hardly uses any, you know, that's that's not what Ohio is doing, it's not what Michigan's doing. Um, so Okay, so Corey, I'm going to give you kind of like the king for a day one. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you guys have heard yet, but FHWA and Napa have re recently met at a meeting talking about how can we remove or assist the removal of some of these barriers of these wrap ceilings that we're seeing in some of the mixtures. So the FHWA has agreed to help go down that road with the industry just to try and see, well, what is the barrier? Is it something that they can help with? So your king for a day moment is the, you know, describe some of those hurdles, like what would you change? What are the, if we said today from this point forward, you can use as much wrap as you want. Mm -hmm. What's the realism of that statement? Well, one thing that I have noticed, you know, throughout my career with being you know, involved in asphalt in many different states is that one thing, there is always one common denominator that limits you on what you can and can't do. And that's the type of material that's available to make the asphalt. Okay. I mean, the asphalt's only going to be as good as what you can put in it. Um, and material deviates so much. I mean, just from within your own state, let alone from state to state, you know, I mean, we, we see that in Florida, Tanya, you know, that from South Florida versus North Florida, you know, the quality of aggregates, um, the same thing here in Texas, you know, the quality of stone, it, it changes depending on where, where you're at. 
Um, so, you know, when they when they come up with these specs, um, you know, the standardized spec on limitations of wrap, you know, I think we need to do as an industry um, and we need to do a better job at defining what our limitations are, depending on the material we're using, because, you know, it's not fair or it shouldn't be the same, you know, for people that are dealing with, you know, real soft limestones um, where you have high absorption levels and low gravities and stuff versus people that have good material and, you know, in certain parts of the state and, have, you know, and have really good gravity. So, um, you know, I think there needs to be more studying involved in that as far as an industry goes, because, you know, nothing, you know, not everything is equal, right? You know, um, so um, I think that would be one hurdle we probably uh, need to get across is, you know, is uh, maybe adjusting our specifications more per region or or however you want to identify that um, and not make it a standard tech, you know, spec across the board for like the whole state. Um, and, um, you know, I mean, I, I don't know. I think I think that's that's one of the big, big problems we run into. And in, in my opinion is just that, um, you know, you you're just uh, stuck with a standard spec um, and we uh, and I think it needs to be more has has to be more relaxed type of specification. I mean, if you can prove the end result, and then why why you know I've always been a firm believer. It's like okay, if I can prove that I can get to the results you're looking for or specifying, then why should it really matter how I get there? So you're teeing up my next question for you guys. Perfectly done. It's like we planned this. So the the, the follow up to that is exactly what you're talking about, right? That's the whole push towards that balanced mix design side of it. Yep. And if the balanced yep. mix design is going to claim to do its job, then that do you feel like implementing or continuing to move forward with that concept is going to help us with some of that uh, hurdle of using more wrap. Oh yeah, I, I definitely think it, I think it will because it's going to open. It's basically you know it's going to open another you know tool, and you're going to be able to you know with having the balanced mix design because I mean you know it's kind of like what Eric mentioned a while ago. You know they're Marshall versus the Super Pave. Um, you know I mean. I, I'm also a fan of Marshall for certain reasons because I like Marshall mixes because obviously Marshall is still a proven um, method. I mean, it's been very successful. Um, it's, you know, it's just a different way of how you're compacting the specimen, right? So, so, but at the end of the day, you're still looking for those same target results, you know, air voids, VMA, whatever it may be. So, um, you know, I mean, the P401s and the P403s have been around forever, you know, we're landing airplanes on them. So, I mean, they, they're probably not too bad, right? Um, you know, and most people, I mean, they do have a, a uh, you know, a super pay version um, to, to do it in a gyratory uh, for, for both of those mixes. But most people tend to lean towards the Marshall because it's easier to achieve those numbers. Um, so, um, you know, I, I just think, um, I think that's, uh, you know, that to me, that's, that's really what it boils down to. I think, uh, you know, if we can get to a point in our industry where we cannot get so stuck on the little things and look at the big picture and okay, what are we looking for for an end result? Um, you know, I mean, we know we need density. We know we need, you know, a certain amount of air voids, not too little, not too much. We know we need, you know, VMA and so on. Uh, you know, we've proven that, you know, I mean, there's been enough testing and, you know, performed and whether it's at NCAT or anywhere to, to prove that, you know, we know we need 
these certain numbers to get the longevity out of our pavements. Um, but we don't need to be stuck on, well, how do we get there? You know, uh, the process, you know, it needs to be more of a, you know, it's kind of like when SuperPay first started, we went from, you know, this is the spec and then we went to performance-based specs and so on. But I think, you know, the balanced mix design and, and um, I think will we'll definitely help. I would ask um, Brett from a standpoint of your industry now, I know that a lot of the associations also include your suppliers, also include some of the other companies that come into the state. Are you seeing an uptick in possibility of like either some different chemicals, rejuvenators, et cetera, coming through the state since this balance mix design and the want to use higher wrap has come up? Yeah, I'd say there's more interest in, in getting involved in what's happening at the state level. Um, <clears throat> MDOT, 10 years ago or something, thereabouts, um, realized like many other states in the nation that and when they moved to super pave, the mixes got more dry and brutal. Um, they took it upon themselves to modify their specification and regress air voids with liquid AC. Um, there's been a few iterations since the initial uh, spec change, and now we design at 4% and then regress down to 3% um, via liquid AC only. So that's gone a long ways to improve performance here in the state. So the department is kind of watching, learning what's happening on the BMD side of things, um, because at the end of the day, I guess my personal opinion is that's how true innovation is gonna come is tell the industry what the end spec needs to be. What do you want it, how do you want it to perform? And then let the contractor figure out the, the materials that go into it and the, and the recipe, uh, utilize the tools in the toolbox, whether that be a recycling agent, warm mix agent, and I strip what, you know, whatever that may be to reduce temperature, increase wrap, you know, use products that maybe we haven't used before, um, but at the end of the day, still ensure that we end up with the performance long-term that, that we're after. And it may, it may even, it may even increase that long-term performance when we open the doors uh, and, and start to get to that. I think we, I know this isn't all about balanced mix design here, but you know, we're, it's a lot of lead states looking at that. There's a lot of unanswered questions, but I think we're we're he we're headed that way as an industry, and that's that's a good sign. Um, so I think that will definitely go a long ways. And I think right now, at least, kind of one of the things that I wish we could do here in our state um, to kind of overcome the hurdle about you know getting more recycling is I think education. There's a there's still a, a stigma out there that you know. There was some failures a while back, um, maybe due to rap, maybe not. I don't, I don't know if anybody knows the, the true failure, but we've, we've come a long ways as an industry. Um, we've come a long way working with, you know, federal highways and, and DOTs on how to better process rap, how to better utilize it, how to better design with it and to overcome all those things. The plants are far more technologically advanced than they ever were. And I think that we've successfully proven that we can utilize this material at higher percentages than we could before. We've got NCAT test data, MinRoads. We got several DOTs that have done a lot of work on this subject. So I think part of that is just stepping back and educating the people that, that saw or thought there was a failure and just said no to wrap or cap to wrap you know, at 10% or whatever. I think educating those folks on the progression of RAP and specifications and research and everything over the past, say, 20 years or whatever, would go a long way in moving those percentages up. I agree uh, wholeheartedly on the education standpoint. The, um, so NAPA has developed the, uh, the task group for the RAP utilization, which is going to survey all the states and um, the contractors, the, the agencies, to look at RAP usage, where the hurdles are, where the hangups are, what is and is not working, to try and get a compilation of everything that's going on as much as you can get a comprehensive look at it. I know that there's a lot of exceptions and nuances in specifications. It's like 
you know, pole density or, you know, look at the wrap. It's good here, except for when this long list happens. So it, there's a lot of nuances in there, but on the overreaching uh, portion of it, we should be able to pinpoint approximately where each state sits and then try to drill down a little bit on what, what's, the, what's the fear maybe, or what's, is it risk averse or is there something else going on there? Yeah, so, one of the things here in the state, sorry, just real quick to add on to that. One of the things that is frustrating here is that when you get, we have 83 counties and, you know, like the states, 83 counties, and MDOT has a spec for them that they can, they can utilize, but um, some do, some don't, some cap at 10, some cap at 15, and these are counties that border each other. So something magical happens at the county line where, you know, 15% you know, is no good here, but you, you know, one foot to the south, then, then it is. And the, the part that really frustrates me as a taxpayer is that is just adding costs to all the counties. So that's a different mix design that that contractor has to make, has to produce. There's waste material in between those production runs. And for what, like Corey mentioned, you know, maybe something more regional, um, but not, county to county so that and I think that comes back to that whole education thing just you know, yes agreed it's rolling kind of our well, sleeves up and getting back to the basics so. right and Corey can attest to the whole you know several DOTs or several agencies with all within the same area or state um <laughs> yeah. I think that describes Texas as a whole yes but uh so Fanyan does have a question for Eric um timely because Eric I'm putting you on the hot seat now and from an agency perspective, do you need, do you see a need to better assess or screen the quality of wrap to ensure good performance of high wrap mixes? Not all wrap is the same in, uh, not all wrap is the same in terms of quality. Checking wrap binder content and gradation is a good practice, but what about wrap binder quality? A super stiff PG, like a hundred plus, uh, grade wrap is going to perform very differently from a soft grade of the PG 7682-ish uh, grade wrap. But unfortunately, binder extraction and testing is time consuming and can be challenging to implement. I'm sorry, Fan, if I butchered that reading, but <laughs> hopefully, Eric, you got the, the gist. Yeah, I, I read the question. So. Okay, perfect. Um, it really, like for Ohio, we basically require the contractor to make a big pile, establish it and test it. And then they can't add to that pile. So to do binder testing, they already do that. I mean, they do the GS, the, the specific gravity for the GSC calculations. Um, sure, it's extra testing. I mean, it's extra testing, but it's, I mean, it could be done. Um, I think the question is when you get into like your, um, recycling agents and dosing and all that, you're probably, you're probably dosing it off of wrap and mixture for extraction gradation, those type of things, um, or recovering the binder and testing the binder. So I think in Ohio, we're probably, whether we care as much for the wrap, but I think the contractor is going to want to know, is that wrap 100, PG 100 plus, or is it PG? 82, whatever. So um, for the most part in Ohio, we're low 90s for most of the stuff we have. So it doesn't really vary a whole lot, but um, maybe states like Texas and Florida, you might have a little bit of variance depending on where you're at, but. Um, and Corey, I know we had a conversation about this you know, just actually like a, a few minutes ago, um, if you want to weigh in on that question. Yeah, um, so basically, you know, it's to me, it's very important that you fractionate, you know, the material, um, you know, you could because you're, you're going to capture a lot more of your liquid from your fine wrap than you will your coarse wrap through the, you know, through the mixing process. Um, from what I, from, you know, from, in my opinion, anyway. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, but fractionating the wrap is very, is, is key, I think, to a good uh, uniform, um, you know, mix 
um, to for consistency basis. And you know, of course, um, when you're dealing with uh, test results and standard deviation, consistency is key. Um, so, you know, I, I mean, that's that's really kind of what it what it boils down to. To me, it's more important on how you handle the material and how you fractionate it more than where the material is coming from. Um, you know, I think if you have a if you have a really good feel and, and good data on the on the fractionated material, um, I think you're going to get very good results, um, no matter the source, um, whether it comes from a, you know, DOT project or it comes from a, a county project or, or whatever. Um, you know, now there are some exceptions, of course, you know, I mean, you don't want like a bunch of chip and seal mixed in it and so on. Um, you know, something that has just these large amounts of binder and no aggregate and that causes spikes in your liquid AC and and um, really throws everything all over the place. But but I think for a good for a good mix, uh, you can use a large amount of wrap if it's uh, if it's processed properly. Yeah, I would say that um, I'm just going to weigh in for a real quick comment on fans uh, question is just about the the extraction gradation process I get it can be cumbersome and it's a little time consuming, you know, the auto extractor process has shortened that time up a little bit. But the overall, I think part of the hurdle becomes if you're trying to do a full blending chart, right? So if you're trying to fully characterize that binder from the top end down to the low end and then blend everything through and calculate whether or not I need, you know, 2.6% versus 3.2% uh, by weight of virgin binder for my rejuvenator, that starts becoming a process, right? That's not an on the fly, hey, I'm gonna mill up this road and put it back in type of system like you were talking about earlier, Corey. So the, I, I think some of that, fan, I do agree, but there's gotta be some kind of cutoff that you can't get so nitpicky to the point where it's going to be at every grade increment like you would on a normal original uh, graded binder. It, I know that Florida has implemented, a, you know, the 100, the PG 100 as your cutoff. It's above, below, and you're allowed certain tolerances or certain amounts of wrap in, depending on how your B PG grade uh, comes out. Um, but yeah, I do think that the quality is going to have to be a factor once you get up to a certain percentage of wrap. If you're only putting 10% in, and that's the, the only effect you have, is it really worth going through those hurdles? But if you're going in at like 35 or 40%, and above when it starts becoming part of your majority, I think the quality of that wrap binder is really going to play a role. Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, that's like what Corey said. We don't really fractionate in Ohio. So we, we tend to, we have some districts that say that usually when contractors produce over 25% volumetrics kind of go away, it's probably due to the fact that the piles are not consistent throughout. Um, the ones that do fractionate tend to do a lot better with volumetric. So, um, and then I think BMD is going to be huge. How depending on how you look at it, um, are you going to do? Are you going to rely on BMD at the final the final product? Uh, you know, if your wrap changes a little bit, add a little bit more. If your cracking index drops, do you add a little bit more recycling agent and bump it up and? Make sure you don't go overboard with it and get into the writing area, but that's where I see it. I, I would see, because that's what we're looking at is trying to figure out how we can allow contractors to add the piles, which will help eliminate the 1100 JMS we have to approve every year. So you just let them. <laughs> um, so from a, a aspect of availability, Brett, I mean, you know that the the big legislative funding that's coming through and it's like kind of knocking on everyone's door. We keep hearing about it. We keep uh, seeing things. Oh, it's coming. It's coming. But I guess my question is, is that, you know, that funding could go in several different directions, right? Depending on who gets it, how they decide to distribute it. 
the idea of maybe even putting it towards more capacity, maybe, maybe not so much resurfacing, but capacity. But when that happens, are, are we fearing that with so much work and possibility of increased capacity that the rat piles are going to disappear or there's going to be a supply problem in that, in that realm of um, issues? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, uh, that's very much a possibility. Obviously, it depends on how much rap, pot, you know, rap you've got stockpiled in your yard now. Um, but yeah, we've seen it in certain areas around this state here that have gone to full reconstruct. So brand new pavements where, you know, we're, we're removing concrete, putting back asphalt. Um, there isn't any rap coming off the job and you're putting back you know, 10, 12 inches of asphalt um, and you've got 25, 30% wrap average in there. Yeah, you're starting to burn through wrap faster than you're bringing it back in if there's not any resurfacing around in the area. So I don't think we've hit that yet, but I know I talked to a few members that, that are concerned about, you know, what is going to be the future for wrap and trying to hedge their bets and figure out where they can haul it from and come up with, you know, figure out where in the state there is excess and figure out how to either, you know, have in a backhaul or if there's rail opportunities or whatever, just make sure we have supply for uh, a rainy day because it is a, a very big um, bargaining chip when it comes to, to bidding work. So you got to have it in order to be competitive. So yeah, that very well could be an issue. Um, if, if we start to switch to new construction or added capacity or full on reconstructs and there isn't wrap coming off, off the job soon. Um, Corey, I'm gonna, I don't know if you've seen, FHW put, put out a tech brief on wrap and the, the performance of wrap and the, some of the states they have kind of uh, did some virtual tours and visits of well-performing uh, pavements and Nebraska made it, they made an interesting story out of Nebraska and they had noted that they actually incentivized the contractors to use more wrap by giving them back a certain portion of the cost savings that they have calculated for the amount of wrap that they used. So they each contract has a label on it that shows the tonnage, the amount of wrap, what they have deemed in their calculator as the cost savings by using that wrap and then they get back a certain portion of that cost savings. Um, now they do have the asphalt binder as a separate pay item, which they say uh, helps them allow or allow them to do so. But from an incentive standpoint as a contractor to increase that amount of wrap that you're using now, does that, have you ever heard of that number one? And number two, what other things would you say would incentivize you to, to start increasing it? across your plants? Well, um, if there's any way to motivate a contractor, that's an offer an incentive, right? <laughs> You'd be amazing what, what a contractor, how creative and how, uh, how, how much they can do whenever you uh, offer an incentive. Um, but, uh, you know, um, I have heard of that before. And, um, but, um, you know, it's, uh, I think, um, you know, you just, you got to kind of got to be careful on that a little bit um, for the reason, you know, I guess, you know, some people can use it for the wrong reasons, I guess. Um, you know, we ran into that trouble, I think, in the industry with RAS. I know this isn't a RAS topic, but, you know, but we, um, you know, I think the industry kind of got hurt, you know, a little bit with the RAS situations. I know it in Texas it did. Uh, we had some people kind of, you know, um, abuse it because of, they were noticing the cost savings and they didn't realize that the, there was some limitations, you know, as far as how much you could put in um, and uh, without, you know, really adjusting your binder grades. And then we were dealt with a bunch of cracking and so on. Um, but um, so, you know, you just you just have to, uh, you know, I, I think that that could be a good useful tool. It would just have to be managed properly, in my opinion. Agreed. Like anything else, right? The abuse right. is always available. Yeah. <laughs> um, cool. Now, Eric, we have a um, 
you, you're famous now. <laughs> you are. You recently had an article in Road and Bridges um, or an interview if from Road and Bridges that talk about the use of high, uh, a high recycled mix using the technology of a, a this particular batch plant. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that job, what the kind of the mindset from the department uh, was and why that was such a big deal for you guys. Well, so we had uh, kind of a smaller company. Uh, one of the sons of the company branched out and kind of bought a high wrap or high recycling technology batch plant. Um, and they've been doing commercial, mainly commercial. Um, they started working with the city of Columbus. Um, we're talk, they were in talks with us for probably four or five years as they were trying to buy it. But um, we're always looking to try to, I'm always, at least I am, trying to figure out how do we can increase our wrap. We had an opportunity, we, we developed our cracking test, which was the ideal CT. Um, once we had that figured out, then I challenged that the owner of the company to find a job that we could, or fits one of the districts within within his area to get a job and we could put something in. So um, found the job, it was a small job, which is probably a pretty, pretty good for the first job for, for state work for this. Um, it was about 4.6 miles, a little bit more than 2,000 tons worth of, with, worth of mix. Um, it had 55% wrap in it. They used recycling agents. Um, I think 5828 was the virgin binder. Then the control had 20% wrap in it. Um, this is a district that uses 70 minus 22M for, for a Marshall medium traffic mix. and mainly just for the aggregate. The aggregate quality is not there, so we, we tend to uh, use PD-7022. So the 55% wrap was to grade out as a 70 minus 22. It was placed late, late August. Um, production, the volumetrics, gradation, all that stuff, I mean, it was spot on. Um, didn't really change um, without seeing it in person it was it was amazing how how precise that was and they and they fractionated the wrap for the 55 percent um so we grabbed a bunch of samples um we sent we sent the federal highway they sent us the results back about a month ago so um some with some of the testing so um they did a lot of the performance testing like ampt and some of that just to kind of give us an idea of how that would perform maybe outside the testing that we could do. Um, we did skid, skid testing, really no difference between both both the control and the and the high wrap. Um, we did some other stuff that Federal Highway was trying to play with and we had a word that we could do it on, so. Now this was a balanced mix design, correct? So yes, yeah, so along with it being our high, high, high wrap, project. Um, it was our first balance mix design project, official balance mix design project, I would say. So now what approach um, did you decide to use? So approach A, just only because we're currently doing volumetrics already, and it's probably the most comfortable for as a DOT at this moment. So um, they set the limits, the contractor actually set the limits for the high wrap at 120 index minimum. Um, I forget what the, the Hamburg, um, we're an APA state, but they they had a Hamburg, so I didn't want them to go and buy another piece of equipment. So um, I think it was like 10,000 cycles under 12, 12 and a half millimeter um, writing. Okay. So, we will be waiting at the edge of our seats to see how that performs. Keep us posted. Yeah, I went, went out a couple of days ago and it's still there. Both, well, that's both positive. Sections, yeah, both, <laughs> both sections are performing, so that's good. Um, so um, from a, a balanced mix design and wrap perspective, Brett, would you say that, does Michigan have a balanced mix design specification? Or are they pushing towards one? No, they're not. Like I said, they're, they, 
regressed air voids a number of years ago, and that has evolved. I mean, I guess pseudo balanced mixed design. There's no performance testing um, to ensure, but I think the proof is in the pudding. They're seeing uh, the performance out on the road. So I think they're pretty happy. But like I said there, they are taking part or at least listening in on the various conversations that are happening. Um, and I don't think adverse to going that direction. They're just kind of happy where things are at, but we need to pay attention because this probably is the future. So understood and Corey I have to ask this question only because I don't know if um, anyone would forgive me if I didn't sustainability when in relationship to rep and how the contractors are handling the the EPD uh, conversations and the in relationship to maybe using more rap in order to create their EPDs accurately. Have you guys or Anderson Columbia thought down that pathway and have you looked at it? Yeah, I mean, I guess you can't help it, but you have to look at it, right? Um, you know, uh, it's, um, I think it's, it's, uh, it's definitely challenging. Um, you know, uh, uh, of course, you know, fortunately, the two states that we operate in primarily, um, permitting is not a huge issue, um, you know, and uh, so, I mean, that that's, tends to, uh, to be helpful. So, um, you know, we, uh, we, we just really, um, you know, we're kind of keeping an eye on it and just, just kind of, you know, tracking it um, and, uh, but uh but you know it, it definitely restrictions definitely uh play a part as far as you know how much you can use of course so that's <laughs> that's definitely yeah. something you got to be careful with yeah absolutely um so john i would say that i'm going to go around the circle and kind of see whether or not you guys have any last comments and I would like to get even if you make your answer up I'm going to ask this question anyways and see whether or not you can think a little bit about what is making the biggest impact um, in relationship to using more rap do you feel like it's the performance of the mix having everything to do with understanding and education getting the word out being able to uh, make it last longer is it the economics um, or is it the supply you know, urban versus rural, is it something else that's going on uh, where it's being placed, the stipulations on the mill and uh, the, using millings in order to be able to put it right back out in the road? And then just any final words for any of those states kind of struggling maybe with that thought process of increasing RAP um, percentages and allowances as they move forward. So biggest impact, performance, economics, or supply? And then final words for those that are considering using more rap. Um, Brett, you're up. <laughs> I won't defer to Corey on this one. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll take it first. So, um, so as far as the biggest impacts to using more, um, I think that's a tough one to answer. It depends probably right on where you're at, what state you're in, what area of the state you're in. Um, I think one of the things that could be added to that list is that education thing that I talked about is making sure we've got people that are comfortable. I mean, the data is out there, right? We've, there's tons of research out there that shows that higher wrap or medium to high wrap mixes can perform. And we've got a lot of additional tools in the toolbox that we didn't have when some of this research was happening, like recycling agents using warm mix additives um, to lower temperatures to not age the binder, uh, which increases the performance. Like that's, that's relatively new um, to, the, to the field. So making sure we got people educated, um, but I think yeah, having the, the performance, what I hope we see is some sort of balanced mix design approach where there's a performance metric that is established during design as well as checked during field production, because to fans question early on, like he's spot on, there's those 
those binders are going to perform very differently. But if we can overcome that by adding a recycling agent or changing binder grade or maybe doing both or doing you know a third thing and doing at different percentages. We I think we have the tools to properly engineer these mixes, um, but we don't know you know what we need to do unless we're testing that and, and adjusting on the fly. I think that's one thing we have to we have to suck it up and, and be ready to do that just like any other quality control adjustment. You know, you see your void starting to tick down, you know, you need to make a blend adjustment to bring, we need to be doing the same thing. Otherwise we're gonna have somebody like Corey mentioned that uh, abuses the situation and, and ruins it for us all. So I hope we, we put those things in place um, to make sure performance is not um, the biggest impact. Um, and then I forgot what was the other question. Oh, other things to add. Um, in the interest of time, I'll, I, I'm very interested in what Corey and Eric have to say on the topic. So I don't really have anything else to, to add um, beyond that. So I'll punt to, uh, do I get to choose? You get to choose. All right, uh, I'll go with Eric. I'll give Corey a break, he can, he can end the show. <laughs> um, from a, a DOT standpoint, I think part of it's having confidence in your performance index limits. So is your CT index, is that limit where it should be, should it be higher, should it be lower. Same with rutting. Um, if you can get those figured out and have them some related to some sort of performance, I think at that point it's just opening up specs. Um, I don't necessarily think it's economics, material supply. I think we have. I would be fine if all of our wrap was all of our wrap piles were gone in Ohio. I think that means we're doing a good thing. Um, I think that means we're having we're using less virgin ag, virgin binder, basically giving the taxpayers every every dime back. So um, I would that's that's probably what my answer would be. Would be just like the criteria is what's kind of holding us back right now. Any final words for those agencies that might be kind of teetering on? Do I increase? Do I stay? Do I add more requirements? Don't let recycling scare the wrath out of you. Let's just say that. <laughs> <laughs> Can we quote you on that? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, Corey, you're up. All right. Um, uh, kind of. There's there's a couple different things. You know, scenarios that um, you know you face uh, depending on where you're located at in the state, like uh, Brett was mentioning, and you know, and, and where you're at, where you're at. Um, you know, obviously, um, you're going to have less amount of wrap in your rural areas um, versus your major metropolitan areas. So, um, you know, you're you're going to have that issue. Um, but then you're also going to have, um, uh, you know, the, the biggest issue is is that I think education is very very important i've noticed that tremendously probably in the last five to ten years about educating whether it's um you know a lot of a lot of places you know have ceis which you know are, are uh that the dot is higher and stuff like that and i'm not sure that you know of course they're all being everybody's being certified you know to do their to do their job and, and everything but um Sometimes uh, the information's not getting passed down to uh, the people that are in the field, the one doing, you know, the ones that are doing the actual, you know, inspection or testing. So, you know, whether that's, and, and I'm not going to put that responsibility primarily on the DOT. Um, I think the contractors as a whole, we, we all need to do a better job at educating our people, because like what Brett was saying, and you know, it's the the tool we have the tools in the toolbox, whether it's rejuvenators, you know, or anything, you know, at that nature to maximize the amount of wrap. Um, you know, we need to be looking at that, and uh, we need to be more open. Um, um, but I think there's a big fear, um, which I'm not sure why. I mean, basically, we're introducing a product back into the mix that was once 
the product you know so i mean it, you know it's one of one of the few products that's 100 percent recyclable right you know i mean so um so you know um everything in in the product can be used um so it's um you know education is is very important um whether that's educating um you know our people uh educating you know the ceis um the engineers um you know you would think some of the younger engineers coming into this profession would be up to par with the latest and greatest um you know technology and what's out there um but it doesn't seem like that's always the case um and uh and sometimes it's because they're mentored by the older generation the ones that are more conservative as far as like uh you know we don't want to you know we've we've been comfortable we've had that you know they're in that comfort level of that 20 to 30 percent we don't really want to step outside the box so um so yeah i think uh, education is is really really important Thank you guys. I appreciate that. And just as a very last word um, for everybody, just I would encourage you to go out and number one, read it, the article that Eric did the interview on for uh, Roads and Bridges and um, and go look at those, uh, the two papers that, you know, Tim Ashenberg and Adam Han put out a paper on successful use of reclaimed asphalt pavements and asphalt mixtures. It's just looking at the history and the past I think they said for over 50 years of how that the performance has gone and then the FHWA tech brief I'm gonna um, we're going to post those links for those uh, different things on there with the, the video and for you guys to get access to and hopefully you guys get something else out of those. All right, thank you, we really have to wrap this up see what I did there um, thank you guys for your time <laughs> and. Um, it was really great to just hear the different perspectives, you know, from the different um, departments, so to speak, in our industry. So thank you all for tuning in, and I will see you guys on the next road trip. All right. Good afternoon. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.